everything is part of one ancestral chain. Man. Mouse. Armadillo. No. It's nonsense to think of animals or man as climbing some ladder. To talk of one animal being higher than another. No. No. I think it's more like a tree. A tree of life. My goodness, how very scientific you are, Dr. Darwin. But I think I've heard this before. Could it be a description of the tree of life of the Kabbalah? Like life springs out of the tree of life? Might be. Or how about the tree of life as characterized in the Bible and the Garden of Eden? That might be an analogy also. Or could it be Buddha meditating under the Bodhi tree? The tree of life, the tree of man, the Bodhi tree. What Charles Darwin glimpsed over 150 years ago is now the bedrock of biology. All forms of life on Earth have evolved on a single branching tree of life. Hey guys, let's take a look at ancient Indian sculptures that show the theory of evolution with remarkable accuracy. By the end of this video, I hope you will agree with me that evolution was understood and documented 2000 years before Darwin ever came up with the idea. To understand this, let's take a look at this structure called Ryer Gopuram in Mahabalipuram. This was built around 7th century AD, so it is over 1400 years old. The reason this amazing structure, it, ma it matters because it shows evolution with incredible accuracy. The first figure shows a fish which dominated the planet 535 million years ago. This is called Matsya in India and in modern evolution theory, fishes are regarded as the first large animals that swarmed all over the planet. In some Indian temples, this form is shown simply as a fish and some carvings even show fish evolving into other creatures. For example, in this sculpture in Bitargon Temple, you will see that the fins are changing into legs and the mouth is evolving into a different shape. The second figure shows a turtle called Kurma in Sanskrit and signifies that aquatic animals evolved into amphibians. This is confirmed by Darwin who shows that animals from the sea became amphibians and were capable of living in both land and water. Again, in many Hindu temples, you can see the turtle carved completely as a turtle. In this sculpture, you can see how a turtle emerges out of water while surrounded by other fishes. The third figure is called Varaha, which shows the emergence of rodents and wild boars. Note that we have now entered the age of mammals because all rodents are mammals. Also, it is interesting to realize that we are looking at animals that completely live in land and not water anymore. This is also confirmed by modern evolution theory. The fourth figure called Narasimha shows a very large lion which is the Smilodon or a similar species which is now extinct. Paleontologists agree that these big cats dominated the planet and hunted mammoths and other giant animals. Incredibly, this scene is accurately portrayed in this 12th century sculpture which shows a lion as big as the elephant itself. In other temples, Narasimha is shown as half lion and half man, which shows a hybrid hominid-like creature. The fifth figure shows Vamana, who is always portrayed 
as a dwarf. Now, we know that Neanderthals were never more than 5 feet tall. Other early human-like species, like Homo floresiensis, were only 3.5 feet tall. Notice how Vamana is portrayed with tools but not any weapons. This indicates how the Neanderthals and other human-like species were starting to make use of objects like sticks and stones to survive. The sixth figure shows a bearded man with long hair carrying a simple axe. He is called Parasurama in Sanskrit. This is the first human being or Homo sapien who used crude weapons. The evolution of all other species is not shown beyond this point and Hinduism continues to show the social and psychological evolution of human beings alone. Why? I don't know about you, but I get this creepy feeling that the biologists are still copying the Indian version of evolution. Why would they think that? It's enough that we're top hatted tops in a smart carriage and they're scavenging on rubbish heaps, starving to death. Too many people, not enough food. Thank God we'll always have food on our plates. As you can see, the scene in which um, Darwin created his theory was in Dickensian England where people were starving and so the mindset of these scholars was well, there's too many people we can't feed them therefore we need to get rid of them through natural selection and we must be pretty brazen about it and of course we know this to be false there's too much food uh, grown, grown today the problem is there's too many wars and too many refugees and too much starvation done by man's doing the runts yes, yes, it's not that simple <clears throat> it's not that simple sometimes it's the ugly ducklings that are better adapted to the situations of life they have longer legs and can run faster they have bigger beaks that can crack harder nuts and seeds in harsh winters they survive have more offspring nature selects them to pass on their traits to future generations and where do we fit in? Well, the sun does not revolve around the earth. Nature does not revolve around man. Man must fall into nature's cauldron. He's no deity, no exception. Astounding, Dr. Darwin. You just created and invented a theory that changed the world over a simple glass of port no need to go into the laboratory anytime soon. So if Darwin did not create anything new that people had basically been saying for two, three thousand years, then why has he been promoted as the genius who came up with the idea or the theory? Well, it has been used to justify and is the promoting principle behind all genocides since the 19th since the 19th century and this is called social darwinism and of course social darwinism is the theory that individual groups peoples are subject to the same darwinian laws of nature selections as plants and animals now largely discredited social Darwinism was advocated by Herbert Spencer and others in the late 19th and early 20th century and was used to justify political conservatism, imperialism, and racism and to discourage intervention and reform. This was used by the Nazis to genocide the Jews. This was used by Stalin Stalin, who's supported by the U.S. and British bankers, and Avril Harriman, his special companion, Stalin, and the genocide of 60 million Russians. This was used by Mao Zedong, a relative, a DNA relative of, yes, the Rothschilds. This was used by Mao Zedong to genocide millions, 60 80, 100 millions of Chinese. So that is why Darwin is considered a genius.
a genius because of the principle of genocide that arose out of it like a branch on the tree but this is not the tree of life this is the tree of death Darwin's work began with the observation that individuals differ from each other and these minute differences Darwin believed might be advantageous it might give each individual an edge when it came to getting food or finding a place to survive in nature. Darwin realized that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources. I hope you caught that logical fallacy. The number one logical fallacy is that individuals compete for limited resources in the world. That is false. There is no proof there's limited resources. In fact, just the opposite. Tesla showed through his experiments that there's limitless energy if we top the vibratory capacity, the electrical uh, magnetic source of energy, which is the Earth. You could have unlimited energy. But, of course, that didn't suit his investors, so his papers were stolen and taken away. So they're still promoting Darwin as his master um, genius. But of course, every foundation for natural selection that he lays down is proving to be the opposite. There isn't limited resources. There, in fact, there's limitless resources, um, especially when you look at the, the math. There are the, what, you, the, what physicists call those nasty infinities. When you hit a certain uh, mathematical equation, it goes on forever. Energy is limitless if you can hit that sweet spot in Planck's length, right? That sweet spot, which is infinity. Anyway, also, as some of the fallacy is that organisms die off when there's limited resources. Well, we're finding that to be false again. The great experiment in India. Let's create famine. Let's create no food. What happened? There's a population explosion in India. What happens when they, I don't, I'm not gonna get into it, but I believe AIDS was created in the test tube, but notwithstanding, even if you think it came from green monkeys in Africa, it was virulent to begin with. It was, it killed nearly everyone. And as the species adjusted to it, it started killing the virus. So what these elite are having problems get wrapping their heads around is every premise they make, every rationale they give to destroy humankind proves to be false and proves just to produce, actually produce the opposite effect. I don't know who their advisors are, but their advisors certainly are on the side of the humans because they are not succeeding at their goal. And I do know that their goal was to destroy the earth, so that's why they built all these tunnels and caverns, so they could rush into the ground, into caves, like we see in Stanley Kubrick's um, Dr. Strangelove. But that even has, is proving false. They can't seem to start their nuclear World War III to blow up the planet. I'm not trying to be coy here, but from Roman times, from ancient India, from ancient, from Buddhist, Buddha, 600 BC, all temples are depictions in architecture of the evolution of the earth and species. So when we teach new students that somehow Darwin came up with this novel idea of the evolution of spirit, species coming from simple to more complex, that is a falsehood. And not only a falsehood, it's intentional concealment. Because I have traveled the earth, and every temple I go into, whether it be Gothic, it starts at the bottom layer of the temple architecture. You have the demons, you have the lower animals all at the bottom. You're going to have your um, um, lizards, and then you're going to have your frogs, and it's going to layer up like a layer cake, and then you're going to get the humans. You're going to see uh, the nice pastors, and the women, and the Virgin Mary, and it's going to go up to Virgin Mary, and then it's upward as you reach the top 
of the Gothic Cathedral, you're going to see the angels. And up above the angels, it's going to go into the apse where God exists and you cannot see him. Or let's talk about Aristotle, the great chain of being. Just read Aristotle. He lays out the great chain of being. Root animal to higher form animal to... This evolution is encoded in our DNA, in all our religions, and all our historians. So the fact that people are saying Darwin invented this theory, absolutely false. Darwin, who is a creature of his age, the Dickensian age, the Victorian age, these explorers traveled over to India and they saw these brilliant, brilliant temples depicting lower animals and each layer of lower animal getting up. Uh, more complex, more complex until you reach the complexity. It goes from uh, sea creatures to uh, amphibians, amphibians to mammals, mammals to monkeys, because even even Indians could use their eyes. They viewed the monkey and said, they, they act quite like us. They have opposable thumbs. They, you know, have strange eyes and beady eyes, and, and they eat with their hands, and uh, they can scatter, skitter, scatter across like many of us can do. So they naturally concluded thousands of years ago that there was this great chain of being from simple bacterial life to the more complex and beautiful life of the human. Now also, what needs to be clarified, when Hindus now uh, worship, like they have the monkey god, and they have monkey temples, or they have... Uh, uh, they worship uh, the elephant. There's an elephant god. These are not worshiping gods that are in this form. They are worshiping the age in which these animal forms appeared. And in the great chain of being, they believe all animals are sacred because it's through this great chain of being that the human, which is nearer to God, was created, out of which we sprang. Totally different concept, I mean, same concept as Darwin, who obviously copied it. It doesn't take much imagination to even go into a Gothic temple and say, oh my gosh, let's read Aristotle. Yeah, the great chain of being up to man and then up to God. What um, Darwin was doing was he was just being heralded as, oh my gosh, a great big canoe. Now let's do all the science to prove that white men, white men since those subcontinent Africans and those Indians, oh, they they even claim they come from Indian monkeys. Let's prove that white men do not come from this uh, despicable animal world. No, we come from the fallen angels that had uh, intercourse and sex with these awful, awful human women. Eve, you're so terrible, you're so terrible. Eve, you sinful woman, you harlot, you harlot, you harlot. Yes, that's what, that is exactly what Darwin and his compatriots, especially Malthus, which he mentions that whenever he is reading late at night, he'll, he'll pull out the philosophy of Malthus, who is a anthropos. He does not like humans. He wanted all humans to be exterminated except for the very special ones, which I guess Malthus was included in, and Jerry Macbeth, all these Fabian socialists believed sincerely, and through, I'm sure through much, many hours of torture, which these elite go through as children, that they were gods. And so Bollywood, the beauty of limitless nature.